with everything we've learned about what it takes to operate this game at the level that you deserve. Hey, really quick, before you watch this intro, just keep in mind that this was originally intended to be released around August of 2023 and has long overshot that deadline, so... Yeah, on with the video. It's clear that we, we can't deliver on that original vision for PvE, PvE that was scraps, shown in talent trees, and long-term progression scraps. What that the means we're is that we won't be delivering that dedicated hero mode for talent trees, um, that long-term power progression. Uh, well, those things just aren't in our plans. Not gonna be the and we know that this is going to be disappointing. That we don't bring it up on the roadmap. And to be perfectly honest, it's been really difficult a lot for many of us and a lot of folks on this team to work their hearts so so, bit of an awkward time to be making an Overwatch 2 video, huh? Would be even more awkward if I were somehow officially involved with the game. Oh. This video isn't meant to talk about the general state of Overwatch 2. If that's what you're looking for, then there are plenty of videos out there about that. I also won't be covering much of the technical details in this video because... That's nerd shit. Instead, I'd like to reflect on my experience making the first community-made Overwatch game mode, where I think I did a good job, and where I think I could have done better. To do that, we'll have to go back two months to April 2023, when Blizzard first brought the idea of making an official workshop game mode to me. When Blizzard first approached me with a contract to create an officially featured workshop game mode in early April, with a timeline to deliver in one month, I was unfortunately busy preparing for my graduate school finals. Once that was done eating up my time and energy, I was left with about two weeks to complete the project from start to finish. My deadline was pretty firm, however, because the Blizzard team needed time to integrate the mode into the game and produce promotional materials for Season 5, which, in fairness, looked pretty sick. I mean, check out this clip from the trailer. My ultimate is ready! I am unstoppable! Anyways, aside from some general guidelines like making sure the mode was on theme, relatively short, safe for work, and something all Overwatch players could enjoy, while also preferably featuring some of the heroes that would be receiving skins, I had full creative freedom in terms of what the workshop mode would end up looking like. With the short amount of time I had to build a new game mode, I knew that making a PvE experience was, unfortunately, pretty much out of the question. It just wouldn't be feasible to create the basics of a game, program any kind of AI that just didn't stand still, and debug everything to the point where I was reasonably confident it would work without issue in almost every circumstance. While some jank and crashing is understandable for one custom game lobby, any bug or crash potentially affecting thousands of arcade game instances would inevitably ruin many games and would definitely not help my relationship with the Blizzard team. For the general game design, I ended up with three proposals for Blizzard that I thought might work. The team ultimately ended up liking the Legend of Reinhardt idea the best, so I got to work. First things first, I wanted to refine the foundation of the game mode a bit further now that I wasn't searching for a broad premise. I began by thinking about what made some of my favorite video games, the Horizon games, feel challenging, exciting, and most importantly, fun to play. For those unfamiliar, the Horizon games featured the player, in the shoes of the character Aloy, battling powerful machines inspired by real animals. Combat in these games feels intimidating, not least because technically, these machines can move faster and hit harder than the player. That means if the player tries to just trade blow for blow in a direct fight, they're going to lose pretty convincingly, no matter their skill. Therefore, the player is tasked with using their mobility options at the right time to dodge attacks, or simply set up favorable engagements where the enemy is at a serious disadvantage. I figured this basic idea was a good foundation for my own mode, where Ryan would be the equivalent of the big bad machine and the heroes would fill the role of Aloy, using their mobility options to overcome an enemy that was relentless, fast, and lethal. The need for mobility and or other damage mitigation tactics made it easy to narrow down which heroes could be included as playable characters to face the Demon Lord. However, if you're paying attention, you may have noticed one big flaw. I based my ideal of what the mode should aim for where the heroes avoid damage by using their mobility on a game where the other side of the equation has no feelings. For a mode like this, there was just no way I was going to be able to have the Reinhardt be a bot capable of all of these things within the limitations of the workshop given the time I had. The Demon Lord Reinhardt was going to have to be a player, and I needed to give that player their own fun. 
So to that end, I introduced the power-ups that you can find all around the map. The speed boosts were intended to give the Reinhardt a large advantage when chasing a hero who had an inherent advantage in the mobility department, and meanwhile, inspired by the ultimate charge packs and the battle it for Olympus event and the meat collectibles? Yeah, collectibles and Yeti Hunter, the orange orbs grant Reinhardt 20% ult charge to create opportunities to make decisions aside from just constantly chasing the heroes around. By encouraging Reinhardt to move between locations, I was hoping to discourage the Reinhardt player from camping in a corner while also granting the heroes opportunities to breathe, regroup, and plan. Finally, outside of just the power-ups, I also wanted to ensure that Reinhardt's ultimate wasn't a complete dud against a group of heroes just capable of like rising up into the air on a pedal platform, or wall riding around, or you know, just straight up dashing up into the air. So taking inspiration from the now scrapped PV talent trees, I made the Earth Shatter area of effect a complete 360 degree sphere to combat the vertical mobility the heroes possessed. Of course, there were many more decisions that went into making the mode, but skipping over all that, and with a basic prototype in hand, it was time to get some outside opinions. I gathered together a group of creators to playtest the mode, and we loaded up the game. And Reinhardt lost. Hard. He was simply getting outgunned and bullied by the heroes. There were also some characters who were clear favorites over the others for various reasons, including Orisa who was able to essentially prevent Reinhardt from ever being able to do damage by cycling her cooldowns. On the other end of the spectrum was Genji, who was alright, but his ultimate was pretty lame against a target that could shrug off sword swipes and two shot him at close range. I'll spare you the cycle of playtest, tweak, repeat, but here are some of the highlights of the changes I made. Enabled Reinhardt's shield. Gave Genji more HP while using Dragon Blade to make him more effective at close range. Increased Orisa's Javelin Spin and Energy Javelin cooldowns by 50% to provide windows of vulnerability to the Demon Lord. Gave Junker Queen and Genji the ability to slow Reinhardt with their bladed melee weapons as a reward for risking close proximity. Made Junker Queen and Life Weaver move 30% faster to grant them more evasive potential. With these tweaks, the game was starting to feel more like I had envisioned, with Reinhardt being able to find moments of opportunity to attack, and the heroes all having some options to outmaneuver the Demon Lord's advances. After a few more rounds of playtesting and debugging, my deadline was mere hours away, so I uploaded my work at 10.18pm on May 1st, messaged the team, and went to bed. Fast forward a month and a half to June 13th and Season 5 finally arrived, making my mode available to the public. After two weeks of evening and weekend work, and one and a half months of waiting, with only a select few people knowing a workshop developer was making a game mode officially adopted by Blizzard, much less playing the mode, thousands, perhaps millions, of people would be logging on to play and critique my work. How did it turn out? Well... That is awesome! Listen to my voice! <laughs> Whoa, he's got, Oh my god, he's just rolling! Oh! I got him again! Oh no! Oh my god! <laughs> Damn! Oh! Oh, five man Earth Shatter, though, they're gonna give the nano. Yo, oh my God. W. Victory. For something that I had two weeks to ideate, develop, playtest, debug, balance, and ship, I'm pretty happy with how well it turned out. First and foremost, most people seem to think Reinhardt was enjoyable to play, even while losing. On the other side, the heroes generally found Reinhardt to be a credible threat, requiring them to utilize their movement abilities and brains to evade Reinhardt themselves, or assist allies in doing the same. Initial matches also tended to see Reinhardt either winning with only one life left, or losing with less than 10 kills to win. The cat and mouse game between the teams led to some intense and satisfying moments where a hero would barely avoid the Demon Lord, 
or Reinhardt would finally track down and corner his prey. Of course, not everything was divine light in chromatic arcs. Sunshine and rainbows. It's time to address the elephant, or should I say horse, in the room, Arissa. I originally introduced Arissa because she provided an alternative pick to Junker Queen, where I wanted Junker Queen to play as a hit and run skirmisher using her shout to maintain distancing from Reinhardt. I instead envisioned Arissa holding her ground temporarily with her cooldowns before either running away or falling to the Reinhardt. However, in practice, Arissa tended to be able to simply tank the Demon Lord and could even survive the Demon Lord during his post ultimate buffs. So, what went wrong? Part of the reason is that Arissa and Junker Queen simply had more HP than I had intended. The bonus health from the tank health passive was enabled in the arcade due to the roll lock I had included, and I had not foreseen this and ran playtests with a tank roll passive bonus health disabled. While this certainly gave both characters a much higher degree of survivability than I had anticipated, a larger reason why Arissa slipped through the cracks during playtesting was in part due to the limited number of playtesters I had at my disposal. I often ended up using bots to fill in for players during playtests when I couldn't summon a full lobby. In retrospect, this created blind spots in my playtesting and results because my game mode was limited by the behavior and capabilities of the bots. And just to be clear, in no way is this an attempt to blame Blizzard or anyone else, it was simply an oversight on my part. As an example of how the bots skewed my analysis, since there's no Life Weaver AI present in the bot selection menu, I did not get as many chances to see how often Life Weaver could essentially negate one of Reinhardt's potential kills. In addition, while a full playtest did reveal that Arissa was a strong pick, in subsequent playtests, a 50% nerf on Arissa's javelin related cooldowns seemed to bring Arissa roughly in line in terms of balance and feel, though for various reasons, including a large skill variance in playtesters, this perceived balance was still a little off the mark. Going over every other thing I wish I had caught or could have added would take far too long, and this video is long enough as is, so here's a brief list of things that were either on the backlog or that I would address with the benefit of hindsight. A lack of a comeback mechanic, where the game mode subtly favors the side that is doing worse mid-match. This isn't as nefarious as you might think. For example, the payload moving from being near the attacker's spawn towards the defender's spawn in Escort is a comeback mechanic. If the attackers continue to do well, they will incur a penalty in the form of a longer run back time for themselves and a shorter run back time for their opponents. In the case of Defeat the Demon Lord, unfortunately there was no natural comeback mechanic, so matches could be decided well in advance of the actual victory screen. Having a wider variety of maps for more potential replayability value or more varied gameplay, or just focusing on one map. In retrospect, trying to include Eigenwald for the sake of including another medieval-esque map was a poor decision because it added many confounding factors in terms of engagement opportunities that I did not have a chance to playtest. A potentially controversial idea? Giving Reinhardt ways to recover health such as lifesteal. For the Reinhardt player, this would encourage push-forward combat, but could also backfire by making it much harder for the heroes to win across varying player skill levels. Finally, I wasn't personally very happy with how the game mode often forced Ryan to essentially run between power-ups to be a threat in some matchups. One of my stated goals was to threaten the heroes at all times, and while this sometimes was the case, in other situations the Reinhardt could only be threatening with ult, which was best obtained by running away from the heroes and collecting ultimate power-ups. Ultimately, I've come away from this amazing experience with three lessons. One, and I'm blatantly stealing from GameMaker's toolkit here, is Valve's motto of playtest early, playtest often. I'm no expert game designer, but in my opinion I got very lucky with how relatively well the balance and the feel of the game mode turned out with essentially three rounds of playtesting. Even with such a relatively simple game mode, there were so many possible points of failure. The unbalanced score to win could have been a bigger pain point than it is right now, the power-ups could have been under or overwhelming, and on top of all that, the vast range of potential player skill levels could affect how pretty much everything plays out. In future projects, I might not get so lucky, and unfortunately, the reality of game dev is that it can take some time to deploy and validate patches, as well as realize when ideas or concepts are simply not worth the resources. Of course, that's not to say that any amount of playtesting can catch all the issues that inevitably arise, especially once a larger player base subjects a game to a veritable trial by fire, but playtesting can catch a lot of big issues that I was frankly very lucky to not encounter more of. Two, by focusing on an ideal vision of what the game mode would require, 
Some players were alienated. Despite what you might think, I actually think this was the right move. As Sean Davies, technical director at Rare said, if all you do is respond to feedback, you end up converging on a fairly middle of the road game, and you don't end up with those moments of surprise and delight. In other words, trying to please everyone ensures that no one will actually enjoy the experience. Granted, I don't mean to imply that I made a mode that is objectively great, but rather that by focusing on what I found fun, people who also found similar things fun seem to genuinely enjoy the mode, and that I personally feel this trade-off was worth it despite the numerous complaints from other players that did not find the experience fun. Finally, the last lesson I've learned from working on Defeat the Demon Lord isn't strictly related to game development or even engineering. Rather, it's that success is rarely, if ever, achieved alone. Even though I was the sole workshopper on this project, my path here was forged alongside Overwatch developers, workshoppers, creators, and players. The experiences and people I've connected with aren't the only things that define the time I've spent with the workshop, but they are a foundation that I have been fortunate enough to stand on to reach for the stars. Thanks for watching.